Hi everybody and welcome back. So I'm going to do a couple little videos here and uh, the goal at the end of them is to help you guys understand those of you who don't. Uh, for those of you who do this may not be interesting or it might just be review or something. But what we're going to look at is eventually we're going to look at amplifier biasing and amplifier classes and I'm going to stay specifically on class A, class B, and class AB and some of the different little variants to that. What we're not going to look at is class D amplifiers or some of the more exotic designs like the class H and the class G because that's a little bit too much to get into on this. So really what we want to do is kind of go through the evolution of all this um, starting with class A then starting with a class B and then finally ending up with class AB. So the first thing we need to understand and that's what this video is going to be about is exactly what is AC current and DC current. So if you look on the screen here there's two waveforms and at first as soon as you see that sinusoidal waveform, the first thing you think is those are AC waveforms. And if you thought that, well, you would only be partially correct. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at these, there is something different between the two of these waveforms. They look the same. They're the same frequency. But one of them is, in fact, AC and the other one is in fact DC depending on how we look at it. Now <laughs> this is where things can get confusing and that's why I put this up here. If you're confused right now hopefully by the end of this video you won't be anymore and you'll be able to understand a little bit more about this. In order to understand the classes of amplifiers and why we have to bias an amplifier in a certain manner you first need to understand this. So there's a clue here. Take a good look. And you should be able to tell by looking at this oscilloscope, hopefully, which one is AC and which one is DC and why. After you give it a look, I'll have you zoom in a little bit here. I'm going to get a little closer and I'm going to move over to the very starting point of this waveform. And I'm going to draw your attention to something here, namely these little reference tags. See, one for channel one and two for channel two. This ac actually represents zero volts. And this ap actually, absolutely, <laughs> actually represents zero volts. It's been a long day at work, guys. It's in the evening. I'm kind of wore out here. I've been meaning to get on this video for a while right now but haven't had the time. And if you notice something happens here. On this first waveform if you notice the waveform goes above zero volts and then back down to zero volts. Then it goes back above zero volts and back down to zero volts. Okay? Whereas this one goes to negative voltage, then it goes to zero volts, then it goes to positive voltage, then to zero volts. Notice that? And what's happening is this blue line represents our test lead with reference to ground or to the zero volts. So what's happening is for this half cycle, you're actually seeing negative voltage with respect to this zero volt point, right? And for this half cycle, you're seeing positive voltage. So what's happening is the polarity is alternating. In other words, it's flipping between positive going voltage and negative going voltage. Positive going voltage, negative going voltage. But if you look on this one, it's always positive going voltage and it never goes below zero volts. 
So the polarity is always the same. Even though it's a changing DC voltage, it is always the same polarity. It's not alternating. It might be changing, but it's not flipping positive and negative. And this is something that confuses a lot of people in that just because the voltage is changing doesn't necessarily mean that it's alternating. And I think we use the word AC uh, a little too loosely in the industry. It's kind of our fault here <laughs> as engineers, but truly there is a difference between this and this. What is the difference? Well, first of all, if I attached a diode to this circuit, if I put a diode in series with, with my probe, my oscilloscope probe, what would happen is it would clip off half. It would only allow one half cycle the, uh, when it's in reverse polarity with, res with respect to that diode, it would block the flow of current. Whereas in this one, the current would, you would see the entire waveform the whole time. So let's do that. Let's connect and let's connect our oscilloscope in both of these instances and let's put a diode in there and let's see what it does. Okay, you can see I just have two probes. One's going to the oscilloscope. The other is coming from the signal generator. And you can see I just have the common or the zero volt point tied together. And right here I have a diode. And let's see, focus on the diode camera. And I just have them shorted together on one side right now. Now if I take, and if you look, we're connected to the yellow waveform right now. The blue one, and don't worry, the blue one's scrolling a little bit because the scope is triggering on this one. And if I take this now and I disconnect it, you can see my thing goes, the waveform goes away. But if I connect it to this diode, nothing changes really, right? So if whether it's here or here, the waveform never changes. And if I reverse the diode, I put it in backwards. If I put it on here, I get it. If I go this direction, it blocks it. See that? Reverse it back around. So what that means is that the current is always flowing in one direction only. So this would be a DC waveform. Now let's move this little probe over to the blue waveform. Okay, I've now moved these over to the blue waveform and I've set my trigger to trigger off of the blue waveform. And you can see I have both probes shorted together once again on this side of the diode. Now, if I move it over to this side now, what happens? You can see this part of the waveform is still getting through, but look at this. Here's our zero volts. It stays at zero volts. It never goes negative. And if I reverse the diode the other way, so I move this here and I move this here, you can see now it never goes positive. It only goes negative, but not positive. So in other words, when you have alternating current, a diode will always block half of the alternating current, right? Whereas with direct current, remember when we put this diode in, it either turned it all off or it allowed it all to pass through. Because, again, the polarity never changes, so it is not alternating. So that's what AC versus DC really is. It's very easy to just put a DC level on here and you see a flat line and you say, yeah, that's DC. But it's not always so easy when we talk about something like a changing DC voltage that's not alternating. It's not changing the positive and negative terminals. They're not swapping. So that's just a quick idea of what AC
versus DC is. And this is going to be very important moving forward when we start talking about class A and class B and class AB amplifiers. All right, let's move on to the next part. Okay, for our next little experiment, we have a little thing rigged up. And you can see I have two wires. I have this wire, and it goes down here to the little signal generator down here. This is actually at the top of a signal generator, and I'll show it to you. My little wave tech. And we have my other way, uh, Rigel up here. And one of them is making that alternating current signal, and the other is making the direct current signal. And what I'm going to do is I have this little switch connected. So I can switch between signal generator 1 and signal generator 2. And I'm going to take this microphone, I'm going to put it right in front of the speaker. And warning up front, it is a 1 kilohertz tone. So, so if you have headphones on and you don't like that kind of sound, you might want to turn the volume down a little bit. It's not super loud, but... And I want you to hear the difference Remember, they're both 1 kilohertz tones. There's nothing different in them. They're 1 kilohertz sinusoidal waveforms. They're the same amplitude, which is um, on these ones, 3 volts RMS. Okay, so each signal is 3 volts RMS. That's at 50 ohms. We're not going to get into that today. I did another video on that already. So let's connect this up. Let's put the microphone here. I'll take it off. I'm going to put this right over here and I'll switch it for you. Did you hear any difference? Even with my bad ears, I could hear it. So why do you think that is? They're the same exact signal other than the reference to zero volts. So one of them goes all the way above zero volts and goes up to three volts RMS. <laughs> and the other one goes to positive and negative one and a half volts RMS. And peak to peak, those peaks are still three volts RMS. So that's the only difference. So let's think about that for a minute. And while I clean this up, we'll come right back and talk about it. Okay, so we have another speaker here that's uh, got a little more movement in the cone. And I have a little current limited power supply with just a couple of volts on it. And I'm going to connect a DC voltage to this in one direction. So it's just a DC voltage with the positive here and the negative here. And when I connect it, look at what the cone does. You ready? Here we go. See that? Every time I connect that, it forces the cone this direction, correct? And if I place my wire this direction, so now the positive is here and the negative is here, now watch what happens. See what happens? The speaker drives this direction. But more importantly, no matter which direction we drive the speaker, it always stops at this center position. So in other words, a speaker can move in this direction and it can move in this direction. And because of that, the center point with zero volts is really designed to be with the speaker at rest, naturally how it is like this. So speakers are actually designed to work with alternating current. In other words, they can, move, they can move the same distance this direction as they can this direction. And that whole 
movement, the actual distance of movement in each direction, is called the speaker's excursion. Excursion means to travel, right? Or to, to move, to journey. So the speaker can have excursion in both directions from center. And the only way you can drive it in both directions is with alternating current. If you want the speaker to go one way, the polarity has to be in one direction. And if you want the speaker to drive the other way, it has to be in the other direction. Now, we could just drive the speaker in one direction only, and if we applied a sine wave to it, you would still hear that one kilohertz sine wave, and that's actually what we were doing when we were applying the varying DC signal on there, the sine wave that was all in one direction. And if, but if you notice, there was a difference in the sound between those two things. And the reason being is these speakers are actually designed to move past its center point, back and forth, not this way. Does that make sense? So in other words, the speaker needs to go like this, not like this, and not like this. Or it affects the sound. And that's what you were hearing when we were switching between the true AC signal and the varying DC signal. So this is once again why a stereo amplifier has to ha be capable of reproducing AC signals, not just a varying DC signal that has the same waveform shape. Okay? Hope that all makes sense. And it's because of this that the amplifier classes come, came into being, okay, and why they're important. This is why we do things the way that we do them. Now, understanding this little concept that we just took a few minutes to go over will help you to understand the purpose of why we set up a Class A amplifier the way that we do. And that's what we're going to look at next, what a Class A amplifier is and why we do it that way. Okay, so now that we established <clears throat> that audio signals are actually AC waveforms and not DC waveforms, we kind of know what we have to work with in our circuitry. So now let's look at the first simple type of amplifier. And you can see I have my little breadboardy power supply thingy in front of you with a couple of circuits on it. And the first thing we're going to talk about is just a basic amplifier and why the most basic circuit would never work. So here we just have a transistor and then we have a couple of resistors here for current limiting purposes and so forth. And we're just going to put a signal right out of our signal generator into the base of the transistor. We're not going to do anything with the base other than that. And we're going to look right here at the output, what we get. So I have an oscilloscope attached here, and I have the oscilloscope channel attached here. So channel 1 and channel 2. And if we look up here, look down here at this little circuit, you can see I just kind of put it together. You just have the transistor and the two resistors. And then we have our little orange wire, which is going to our signal generator. And then this is just our probe to our scope. And there's your ground. And there's your positive. So let's look up here at the scope. If it will focus. Thank you. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the just the input by itself first. So we're just going to look at the signal going in Let's see what we have. So there's our waveform, right? And that's just a one kilohertz tone. And if we take our oscilloscope and we put it right there on the collector, you can see you get a wonky looking signal, don't you? And I could play around with these resistor values and get the amplitude to be a little higher and so forth but it is always going to cut off half of the waveform. In other words, this amplifier is only going to work 
for half of the waveform because remember a transistor is a semiconductor it is very similar to a diode in its properties it will conduct in one direction but not the other but we have a signal going in there that is both positive and negative going so that's not right and we can also see that this signal has more amplitude in one dire in the negative going direction than it does in the positive going direction. See, here's our zero volt reference is this kind of the center of the screen. And you can see it's, it goes more negative than it does positive. So there's some offset on there as well. So what's happening is the properties of this transistor <laughs> are, ca are causing all of this to happen. And you can see the transistor is trying to conduct in reverse, but it only gives you a very little amount, and then it clips it right off. So you can see this is not going to work. So this is the reason that we have to put what's called an offset. And in order to understand offset, this is where, where a lot of people get confused um, that are new to electronics and new to transistor uh, theory and things like this. And a lot of this is also applicable to vacuum tubes. Even though tubes do work a little bit differently, a lot of this theory will apply. So anyway, take a good look at that. And then we're going to look at something else. Okay, so as this video is taking me a very long time to make because I only have a very short time each day to work at the bench because things are busy, I'm going to just do this on paper and draw it out rather than do fancy diagrams on the computer. So, sorry, but that's all you're going to get. <laughs> so, if we, what we were talking about with that amplifier is if I just take a transistor right now, and I have an AC waveform. So here's our signal generator. And what we have is a signal. It's a sinusoidal waveform. We already talked about that it goes positive voltage back down to zero, then negative voltage and back up to zero. And that's the signal that's coming out of this signal generator. And if I connect this transistor this way, which is your most simple type of amplifier, most simple type of circuit you can get, if I put voltage onto this voltage divider, this is going to limit our current, right? Then this is essentially turned completely off if I have no signal turned on. So if the signal generator is turned off, this signal is not there there will be nothing here. This will be zero volts. So there will be absolutely no voltage drop between here and here because from here to here acts just like a just a diode. You have a diode drop going from here to here. And if you don't induce any voltage across here and therefore there will be no current flowing through here, then this guy right up here between the collector and emitter will be essentially turned off. It'll be high impedance. So you won't see any connecting point between the bottom of this resistor and the top of this resistor and ground. So essentially, if I take my meter and I measure my voltage here, all of the voltage that's here will measure right here because you're not drawing any current. The only current that will be going through this resistor will be the burden current of my meter, which is extremely low. So essentially, if I have 14 volts up here or 12 volts or 10 volts whatever this is that's exactly what I'll read here because there's no connection to your ground here now if I begin to apply a signal if that signal is positive going then current will flow from the base through the emitter to ground through this resistor and as a result it will cause this junction to activate and you will see that the collector to emitter will begin to conduct. But it will only partially conduct until the voltage reaches a certain threshold. And that's why this is called a semiconductor. And as that happens, this begins to act as a resistor. 
and this resistor forms part of a voltage divider with this resistor and this resistor. So what's going to happen is this voltage that you read here, as current begins to flow here to ground, this voltage here will begin to drop. So as this voltage goes up, this voltage that's here will begin to go down like this. And as the voltage begins to go back down, this voltage will go back up. So if this is zero volts right here, and this is VCC here, right here, right? But when I start to change polarity and apply a negative voltage, remember this acts like a diode, it will not conduct in reverse bias. So what's going to happen is for the entire time that there's negative voltage here, this is going to be turned off and once again this is going to be turned off. So for that entire period of time you're going to have nothing but VCC there. Now down here the opposite's going to happen. If there's no connecting point between your voltage source and the top of this resistor here, there will be zero volts here. And therefore this will be pretty much following what's happening here. So for this, if this is zero volts here, as this voltage begins to rise, this will begin to go up, and then it'll go up until you get the maximum voltage divider voltage between the 330 and the 100, minus whatever the drop is on this transistor. So you can do the math, that's a simple voltage divider, and it'll go up to that voltage, and then it'll go back down, just like this. But the same as with up here, when this begins to go negative, again, no current flows through here, so this junction will turn off this junction here, and therefore, this will just stay at zero voltage for that entire period of time. And if my writing is kind of weird, it's because I'm looking through the <laughs> camera screen as I'm drawing. So you'll have something that looks like this. Okay. So let's demonstrate that. If we look over here, we have a little transistor and we have our two resistors and we have our positive voltage at the top, that's our VCC, and in this case I have 14 volts, and down here is our, our ground. Now, this little orange wire is coming from the signal generator, and this little white wire is going to one of the channels of the oscilloscope. So, if I back it up here, let me loosen this a little bit, you can see this is going to go to the yellow trace on the scope. And this one here is coming from the signal generator and going out to the blue trace on the scope. So first of all with no signal, I don't have anything connected just like we talked about down here. If you go up here, you can see the signal that's at the signal generator but it's not connected right now so there's it's not connected to the transistor but if you look there is this yellow line is a straight DC voltage, correct? It's sitting right now at maximum voltage. And if you look over here on the scope, I'm at five volts per division right here. I don't know if you can see that or not. So if we count up five, 10, 15 would be right here. So come down a little bit, that's, four, that's your 14 volts, just like we said. Now, if I go down here and I connect this signal generator to the base of the transistor, so now this is connected to here, you can see, just like we were talking about, this voltage will drop to the level of that voltage divider. It's limited by that 100 ohm resistor 
and whatever the resistance value is of that transistor, or we call it the voltage drop across the transistor, the emitter and uh, collector junction. So, and you can see it's the opposite. So as this goes up, this is going down, see that? And, and likewise, when this is in its negative half cycle, nothing is happening. It's just staying totally turned off. If we take that channel, that yellow channel, and we move it over to the emitter, like that, you can see we get even less voltage, because remember we have a 330 ohm resistor on the top, and this is a 100 ohm, so this is going to be less than, it's going to be more than three times less voltage. So if I change that a little bit, kind of do my volts per division a little bit, you can begin to see you have about one volt of swing right there is all you got, because I'm at one volt per division now. But you can see it's following the positive voltage. So it's in phase at the emitter end, and it's out of phase at the collector end. And that's how basically how a transistor in an amplifier works. I don't care if there's 500 transistors in an amplifier in the, in the chain, they basically all have this property and it's controlled by these resistors here and by whatever we're putting into the base. Now that's the first concept you have to understand before we can talk about class A and AB and all that other stuff. So if you have to back up and kind of review this again, feel free to do it. But once you understand what we're doing here, we can move on to our next part, and that's what we're going to do now. So the problem we have at hand is that we're only able to, to amplify or reproduce half of our signal, right? And it wouldn't be a very good amplifier if we couldn't reproduce the entire signal. So how do we take this very DC dependent device that really wants to run on DC voltage and trick it into working with AC signals? How do we do that? Well, we do that through something called bias. And bias Okay, bias is what is going to allow us to do that little trick. Let's suppose that we take this voltage and we place a voltage here at the base to partially turn this transistor on. In other words, when there's no signal here, we're actually going to apply a voltage that will cause current to flow here and cause this transistor to turn halfway on. In other words, it is going to be halfway of being fully turned on, which when the transistor is fully turned on, we call that saturation. So the transistor is in saturation. And when it's fully turned off, it's, it's, there's nothing on there. It's, non it's not conducting. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it somewhere in the middle of there. And that's called the linear region. And the linear region is that region where the, there's a certain range of voltages from zero or from a certain voltage to a certain voltage where this transistor will only turn part of the way on. It could be a little part of the way on, or it could be a lot of the part of the way on, but it's not completely conducting. In other words, it acts like a resistor kind of sorta. So what we want to do is if a certain high, higher voltage, let's say I'm just going to pull a number out of a hat, let's say 5 volts here would completely turn this transistor on between here and here, and 2 volts is the threshold at which it will begin to turn on, then we want to put this somewhere between that 2 volts and 5 volts, right? And halfway between 2 and 5 volts would be somewhere around 3.5 volts or something like that, right? So if I put 3.5 volts here, 
this would be sitting at half of its potential voltage. So it would be sitting right about here in the middle. And if we do that, what's going to happen? Well, if I start applying my signal, what's going to happen is this voltage here is going to add to that voltage as it goes up, and this voltage here is going to subtract from that bias voltage when it's here. And that adding and subtracting from the voltage here is what's going to cause this transistor to actually go up towards the full rail and down towards zero volts. So with reference to itself, you're actually reproducing an AC signal. But with reference to ground, this signal never goes below zero volts. You follow what I'm saying? Let's draw, let's make another circuit and it'll make more sense. So now we've made a couple of changes to our little circuit here. And if you look, what we want to do is we want to put that proper voltage here to put this point here right at the center of its quote unquote linear region. And in order to do that, we just use a simple voltage divider. Now, if you notice here, I drew in because I want to show you accurately what I have on my breadboard. I have a couple of three diodes here. And the main reason I did that, and no, I'm not trying to get exotic with thermal tracking and all that stuff we talk about in our videos, but the real reason that I have these diodes here is I didn't have the proper values of resistors to get the exact voltage I needed, but I found that by putting these three diodes in here, those diode drops with this resistor, I was able to get the proper voltage divider I needed so that at this point here on the base, I get the exact voltage that I need. Now, if you noticed up into this point, we haven't really talked a whole lot about math. Um, we can calculate all of this. And I am purposely not getting into the math on this video simply because this is really not a transistor video as much as it is understanding what class A amplification is and, and why it has to work the way it does. So maybe in a future video we'll get into some of the math, but just understand that we can use a voltage divider, which that's math, Volt, the resistor voltage divider uh, formula. And we know that <clears throat> we have voltage between here and here, which is called VBE, which is voltage between base and emitter, VBE, get it? And we have VCE, which is our voltage between our collector and emitter. And then we have the gain of the transistor called beta. And that gain of the transistor is what actually helps us to determine what this voltage needs to be. Because really the name of the game is this thing amplifies current. It's controlled by changes in current more than it is changes in voltage. So the idea is when we set up a proper current flow through this circuit, it will cause a, a similar current flow through here. And that current flow will either turn on or turn off this transistor, okay, depending on how much current is flowing here. Because remember, this is a diode, so in forward bias, it's always going to have the same voltage drop from here to here. And we're not talking about temperature and all that. I know a lot of you guys that are really into this will say, you this, that, and the other. We're keeping it simple for everybody here. So bottom line is we do that math and we can figure out what these need to be and then we choose the appropriate resistors so that we get the proper current flow through here and the proper voltage at here and then we know that this will turn on about halfway which will make this sit at about half of the voltage so if I have 10 volts here in a perfect world if we take everything out of the circuit we want five volts here, right? So that it's halfway between here and ground. And that way, as that signal goes up, this can go all the way up, theoretically, to 10 volts, and it can go all the way down to zero volts, 
but that five volts becomes kind of like a false reference point. It becomes like the new ground. And that's how we're tricking this circuit into working with AC. So remember, this voltage here will never go below zero volts. It will never change polarity. But since it is at half of its value, it can go up to full value and down to zero. So really with respect to this center point, you actually can create an AC waveform. And that's what we're gonna see here now. So let's build this little circuit on the breadboard. And let's talk about these two little capacitors. You notice I had to add these. Well, now, before we didn't need this because there was no voltage here, because there was nothing here. But now, there is an actual voltage here. And if we just connected our signal generator to here, that voltage and that current would actually go through our signal generator. So we need to isolate that DC level. And that's what this capacitor will do. Capacitors will pass AC current, but they will not pass DC. It'll charge up and then to this same potential here and it'll just sit there. Same thing here. This is now sitting at half of its voltage. If you remember when we looked at it on the scope, it was always sitting way up here, right? But we don't want voltage going through our speaker when it's sitting idle because that would burn up our speaker. Remember when I put DC voltage on that speaker earlier in the video and it popped the cone out? We don't want that. We only want the AC portion of that going through there. And when there's no signal here, we want this to be sitting at zero. So this capacitor isolates that however many volts from our load. So that's the whole purpose of this. And we'll get a little more into these, choosing them later on. So let's build this up and look at the signals. All right, so here's our little circuit put together uh, very precariously. And you can see our transistor kind of buried here behind the capacitors. And this little resistor here is just a load resistor. It's, it's a 10,000 10, ohm or 10K resistor because really this transistor isn't really capable of handling much current. And we're not set up to do that. This is more of a voltage amplifier setup. So anyway, here's your 470 ohm bias resistor with these diodes. And then here's the 4.7K resistor. And then you can see this 330 ohm going into the collector and the 100 ohm into the emitter. And there's our ground line here and here's our VCC line here. And of course, our signal that is not connected, it'll go into this capacitor. And our output is right here. And right now I have, a, I have that decoupling capacitor going to the load but we're going to look right at the transistor first and see what it looks like. So with no signal going in, let's take a look at this and see what it looks like. Okay. Now I'm gonna to try to get this all in shot so you can see everything. Now this meter right here is connected between here and ground. So we're actually gonna look at the voltage on here. Now that, of course, we can calculate the current and all that by looking at voltage drop. Just so you know, there's only gonna be about two milliamps of current flow here at idle. So let me turn the power supply on. The yellow trace is the actual, um, the yellow trace is the output and that's what's connected right here on the emitter. So this is going to be the yellow trace and the blue trace is going to be right here. So whoop, turn it on and you can see it's sitting at about half of the voltage we want. We have 14 volts in there and we want somewhere around, I don't know, around six or seven volts, right? And we're pretty close to that. So you can see here's zero volts Here's five volts, here's 10 volts. So we're right at about six and a half, just under seven volts, right? Somewhere around there. And if I move 
the, the scope probe to the other side. So now if I'm looking here, if I move that scope over to here, which we're going to do, you can see there's no voltage over here. It's sitting at zero volts. That's really important, right? So let's put it back where it was. And if we look here, we have about 2.6 volts right here on the base, which is what we need for this particular transistor. This is a, a uh, what is it, a 2N, uh, what is it, 2N5551. And with the characteristics of this transistor, that's about where this is going to be with this output. Now let's apply our signal. So I turn the signal on and that's the blue trace and it's not connected yet see here I'm going to now connect it to the base to the input and you can see there's your output <clears throat> now if I take that same signal or the take my oscilloscope and you can see what it's doing here at zero volts I'm sorry at zero signal there's your center point, right? And when I apply the signal to it, notice it swings above and below that. So if you notice, this is going above and below. So if we disconnect the signal, you can see right here's your center line. So it's sitting at that, would we say about seven volts roughly, six to seven volts. And when we apply the signal to it, we can see the output goes above that 7 volts and below that 7 volts, but it never goes below 0 volts. So this is technically still not an AC signal. This blue trace is because it goes above 0 volts and below 0 volts, so it goes positive and negative. This never goes negative. It just goes more positive and less positive. So we're almost there. <laughs> we have the same signal coming out that we have going in and remember this this blue trace I'm set at one volt per division and this yellow trace is five volts per division so really this is actually a much bigger amplitude signal than this one we'll look at that more a little bit here in a minute uh, but we're halfway there we have the same signal even though it's 180 degrees out of phase we have the same thing coming out as what's going in much better than our first little circuit, isn't it? But now all we got to do is get it to go from being a DC waveform to an AC waveform. And that's the magic that's going to happen by this capacitor. So let me take my signal away and let me move that probe and I'll show you what I'm doing. I'm going to move this probe. This is the probe connected to the scope the yellow trace. I'm going to move it from the transistor to the other side of this output capacitor. So you can see right here, I'm going to move from here to here. So here we go. And I'll just go from here to here. I'm going to show you on the scope though as I do it. I'm going to move from here over to here. Notice now our yellow trace is sitting at zero volts. Now when we connect our signal, how about that? It's going positive and now it's going negative. Now how the heck is that? How is this thing making an AC waveform when all I'm using is DC voltage and it's never changing polarity? Well, that's because of the capacitor. <clears throat> you have to think in terms of reference. <laughs> and that's kind of where it gets confusing is that when there's no signal applied, that capacitor right here is actually charged up to that 7 volts. But since there's no current flowing, that charge is not going to register anything on your voltmeter. In other words, it's going to appear as if it's zero volts because there's no current flowing right now. So with respect to ground, 
right now there is zero volts. But when I apply a signal, when this voltage goes above, it goes higher, then this, is, this capacitor is going to follow it as it charges and it's going to rise with it. When this voltage goes back down, this cap will discharge back down to that level, to that 7 volts or whatever. And then as the voltage goes, as our signal goes negative, it changes polarities, it's going to cause this to go below the 7 volts. And as a result, this is going to discharge in the opposite direction and it's going to make it look like there's negative going voltage here. So really the capacitor is the thing that's tricking the circuit into looking like it's AC voltage because it actually is AC voltage. It's because that capacitor is passing the current in two different directions as it charges and discharges through the load. So the load doesn't really care about anything other than is it charging above where it's sitting at or below where it's sitting at. So is it charging or discharging? That's what this capacitor is doing. That's why you have to have a capacitor in this circuit to make this work like that. Now we're not going to talk about direct coupled amplifiers in this video because that's one thing will lead to another and it'll be a week long video. But that's what's happening. And this is the basic concept of a class A amplifier. Now let's change the references. So I'm going to go over here, or I mean change the scale of the scope. So if you look here, the yellow trace, which is what I'm on, is at 5 volts per square, 5 volts per division. So we're going to change this down to 1 volt, oh, if I go the right way. And if I look at channel 2, it's at 500 millivolts. I'm going to change it to 1 volt per division. And we're going to move over here. So now they're both representing the same uh, scale. And you can see right there what's happening. I'm putting about 3 volts peak to peak, but I'm actually getting way more than that, over 6 volts, almost 7 volts peak to peak out. So you can see this amplifier is amplifying by a factor of about 3. So it's whatever's going in here is about three times as much coming out. So not only is this thing reproducing the, the signal only out of phase, but it's also amplifying the amplitude of it. And that's how a class A amplifier works. Now here's the thing, I can take this speaker, and so here's a speaker, and if I connect it to that same area, to that output capacitor, so I'm going to put this speaker right here. Now remember, the speaker is 8 ohms, and I have a 10K right here now, right? But if I put this 8 ohm speaker onto that point, I just kind of shunt it right across there. I'm going to hold the speaker right next to the mic and listen. Look at the waveform and listen. So you can see we're hearing the sound just fine but it's squelching that whole signal out. It's swamping it out. And that's because this circuit, as it sits, is limiting the current through those resistors. And that's what these resistors are doing. So really this circuit, and if I change these resistors to allow more current flow, and I changed all of this, what would happen is this little transistor would overheat because it really can't carry a whole lot of current. So that being said, that's why you never, very rarely see a one transistor amplifier like this because it really doesn't have a lot of amplification because it can't, these little tiny transistors that have enough gain to do this typically can't deliver enough current. So what you'll see is this transistor has a lot of gain in it if you looked up the spec sheets. But if you look at some of these bigger transistors, you know, like something like one of these, that are, you know, that have heat sinks on them and so forth. They don't have as much gain as these little as these little transistors, but they have much higher current capability 
So what you do is now that we got the voltage where we want it, we daisy chain that into one of those high current transistors and that transistor doesn't really amplify the voltage, it just enables it to provide the current that that speaker needs to drive it. So there you go, the Class A amp. Now, last but not least, we'll talk really quickly about the capacitors, the input and output capacitors. So what's the purpose of these capacitors? Let's talk about that real quick. If you recall, when we put bias on here, you actually have voltage here, right? It's going to be a positive voltage in this case. Now, if it was PNP, it would be a negative voltage. We're not going to get into that sort of thing. <laughs> so you're going to have voltage here with respect to ground. And we don't want that voltage to get back into our other equipment. Uh, and conversely, if there's any DC component here, we don't want that going here because that's going to affect that bias, right? So really all we want is when there's this signal coming out of the signal generator, anytime the voltage rises, it's going to add to this voltage that's here. And anytime it goes negative, it's going to subtract from this voltage here, the way this is wired. And that's what's going to give us our sine wave right here, right? And same thing here, this is sitting at that voltage that it's biased at, which again we determined is around that 6 or 7 volts with our 14 volt supply, let's say. And as we put positive voltage here, it's going to cause this to turn on and it's going to bleed some of this voltage off through here and this voltage will lower. It'll go below that 6 or 7 volts. And as it goes negative, it's going to turn this on harder, right? Because it's going to subtract from here, which is going to change this through here, which is going to cause this to turn off a little bit and cause it to rise. And that's what's going to give you your sine wave out. But the problem is, sitting at idle, as we saw on our, on our oscilloscope, this always has DC voltage, and we don't want that DC voltage going on our speaker, because of course that will damage it. So the capacitor's job is to prevent that DC voltage. Now, a lot of times people will say, you know, they make the generic term that a capacitor will pass AC and it will block DC. And that's really not the right way to look at this. Um, now, a non-polarized capacitor can technically <laughs> pass AC, uh, but on these amps, you quite often see an electrolytic capacitor. And electrolytics, as you know, will only, will only charge in one direction. If you put them in backwards, they short out and explode. <laughs> and anybody that's ever done that and experienced it uh, will have an electro boom moment. And we all know what those are like. So how do we get away with, if, if we know that this is AC here, how do we get away with putting this electrolytic capacitor in there? Well, the reason being is this is still right here, this is DC voltage. And even with an AC signal here, because this is elevated on this side, it's just going to add to or subtract from here. You have to think in terms of what the voltage is doing relative to what, what it's referencing to. So if we look here, let's use an analogy that this is a bucket of water. All right, here's a bucket of water here. And we want to fill that bucket up to here with water, right? It's about halfway full, right? Depends who you are. Some of you will say this, this, is, this bucket is half full, and some of you will say it's half empty. But regardless, it's halfway. And because of that, the water is not leaving the bucket, and it's not entering the bucket. So there's these pipes that are connected to it. We got two straws, right? right one in here and one in here well there's no water flowing so it's sitting there 
Now, let's say I increase this voltage, so I, I go on my positive half cycle of my signal. That's going to turn this transistor on, which is going to allow current to flow between here and here, which is going to cause all this voltage that's sitting up here to drop and it's going to, part of it is going to divide with here. We're actually making a voltage divider, right? So what's going to happen at that point, this capacitor always wants to be sitting at the same level as the voltage, the supply it's connected to. And because this supply is now lower here than it is here, this has to drain some water out. So water is going to flow this way and therefore, with reference to this ground, you're going to see current flow in this direction. And conversely, in a negative half cycle, this is going to turn on a little bit harder, which is going to turn this off a little bit more, which is going to cause the voltage to want to rise here. And as that happens, it's got to fill the bucket up. Right? It, this always wants to be equalized with what's here. So now the current's going to flow this direction. So it was flowing this direction, now it's flowing this direction. If we look at the reference across this, sig this resistor right here, we've got the water flowing into the bucket and water flowing out of the bucket. What's going to happen? It's going to look like AC, right? Because in one one half cycle, the water is coming into the bucket from here and coming out of the bucket and into here. And in the other half cycle, the water is going into the bucket here and out of the bucket down to here. So if you notice, you have that back and forth thing, which is AC. But if you stop any, at any point in there, if you stop and you measure from here to here and here to here, the voltage never goes below zero volts. It always stays between VCC and zero, always. So you have a DC changing signal, but because of where we're, where we're putting our load, the load is tricked into thinking that it's AC. That's how it works. I hope that makes sense. So uh, that's your class A amplifier, and that's how class A works. And really, that's how just about all amplifiers work. And even you're going to see as we get into class B or AB, very similar things are going to go on. Now, I'm probably not going to mock up uh, a drawing or a uh, actual signal, a circuit of the class B and class AB because I really don't have the time to put all that together on the breadboard. But we're going to talk a little bit about it at the end of this video now and then the next project that we do, we're going to look at it on the schematics as we're doing the repair to the amplifier. Now, last but not least, I told you that I would talk to you about the values of these capacitors and why they, some in some ways they do matter and in other ways they don't matter so much. This capacitor the higher its capacitance, of course, the more current that it can supply over a period of time. And the idea is that you have to have enough capacitance that you're not going to swamp this out before the waveform and the current is done doing what it needs to do. If not, it's going to clip. So if I put a tiny little capacitor in here and then I put a really hard load like 8 ohms here, what's going to happen is this voltage will only rise a little bit and then this cap will just swamp out and you it won't you won't see the signal in there anymore and same thing when it reverses so you need enough capacitance in there so that it can handle that current flow for the entire waveform so if you go above that it's really not going to matter a whole lot i know a lot of people will look at amplifiers like this these single-ended amps that are capacitor coupled to the speaker and they'll see maybe a thousand microfarad cap in there and you think well just like vitamins if I take one vitamin and it's healthy for me if I take a hundred vitamins it's more healthy right wrong <laughs> if I put 
double the capacitance, I up it to a 2,000 microfarad capacitor, it's not going to really change how this thing works. As a matter of fact, it's it might be, it might make it worse. Um, at the very least, it will make no change. Now, in some instances, when the capacitor is too low of a value, and when you're going to put a bigger load on there, like four ohms instead of eight ohms, as long as the circuit back here can handle the extra current, putting a bigger cap in there might help you with lower impedance loads. But I'll pretty much assure you that any commercially built amplifier that was built and mass produced, they've already set this to get as much as you can out of this. I mean, you're not going to, if you're a designer of an amplifier, you're not going to design this thing, uh, put the components that are capable of driving a 4 ohm load, and then put a cap in there that will limit it to an 8 ohm load. It's just not going to happen because they want to advertise as much wattage and as much power as they can because that's what sells is watts. And so you're going to see that they're going to pick the appropriate value. So normally going into a commercially built amp and changing this value isn't really going to make much if any difference. So while you were watching this whole video, I hope you ended up with a final question in your mind and that is how in the heck is this efficient if I'm producing a 14 I have a 14 volt power supply and I can't deliver the full 14 volts positive and negative to my load it's really only going to be half which and even less than that this is a very very inefficient system extremely inefficient uh, not to mention because this thing is biased halfway on this thing is already you have current flowing through here all the time to keep this at that center point where we want it to be so you're generating heat anytime you're you're putting a resistor across a power source you are converting a resistor's job is to convert electrical power into heat so electrical energy into heat energy so we're making heat and that heat is doing nothing but heating our room up but is doing nothing to drive our speakers so this is an, an exceptionally inefficient system if you have to draw high current now if all this is is a voltage amplifier kind of like we have it set up right now we don't really care about that because it's just you got two milliamps here and if you times that by the by the gain of this transistor, it's really not going to be super duper high. It's still going to be a little bit, but it's okay. Uh, however, as <laughs> soon as you start putting a low impedance on here and you've got heavy current drawing through here, you're talking about some serious heat. And that's why Class A amplifiers, if you touch the heat sink, they actually run really warm because they're always conducting current. So that's one downside of this. But what's the upside? Well, the upside is you're sitting right in the middle of that voltage, and this is going to go up and down from that center point very cleanly. In other words, it can go right through its zero crossing and go negative, and it can go, it can do it with very low distortion. So a properly designed Class A amplifier will have very, very low distortion. So that's a good thing there. Not to mention it's very simple. You have one active component and then you have a couple passives here and you have an amplifier. So everything has pros and cons. So let's move on to the next type of amplifier. All right, so what we're looking at is a really, really overly simplified version of a class B or class AB amplifier and really as far as the circuit is concerned class B and class AB are very similar now really what it has to do with is once again what we showed you with the class A amplifier do you remember on the class A amplifier that when the transistor was turned off it was not conducting when it was in reverse bias and then when we put it into forward bias uh, 
you would get an output and so you would only see half of the waveform and then we got into the whole idea of class A so that we could see both halves. Well, this has, this has the same situation. The only difference is what if one of these transistors was connected to our positive voltage with respect to ground and our other transistor was connected to a negative voltage with respect to ground. And that way, if we turned both of these transistors fully on the whole way, <laughs> you would have a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here, and the, they would sum up to be zero volts at this center point, okay? In a perfect world, we're saying. And then if we turned one of these transistors off or one of these transistors on, either way, it would change the difference between these two power signals between here and here, and that difference would show up here. So by turning this one on more and this one off more, we could make this be more positive. By turning this one on more and this one off more, we could make this be more negative. And you could see very easily how we could use these two transistors to get the full rail voltage on both sides here. But there's a problem. Early, at the, early in the video, we talked about that there's a voltage drop across these junctions here. They act like diodes, right? So it's somewhere around 0.7 volts, 0.6 volts, something like that. So what's going to happen is as you start to turn this on, nothing's going to happen until you get through that 0.7 volt drop. So the first almost one volt of signal, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts, you know, three quarters of a volt, is not going to make any change here on either direction. So what's going to end up happening here is if I put a signal like this in here, these guys are going to alternate turning on and off, but you're only going to get a signal when you got past your 0.7 volt drop here and then it's going to come back down and you're not going to get anything for for that 0.7 volt crossover point and then it's going to go so you're really not going to get a proper waveform it's not going to look like this it's going to look like this so you can see there's like a dead zone right in here and I'm doing this through the camera viewfinder so if my drawing sucks sorry and we call that crossover distortion. So when you hear people talk about crossover distortion, that's what they're talking about. So to get past that, we actually turn these guys both on just a teeny little bit. And that's called class AB. That's why we call that. It's really not class A because it's not riding at half of the rail voltage and not half of the rail voltage here. But it's just above that 0.7 volts. The idea is you don't ever want this to completely shut off when these are both sitting idle. You want them both to be just a little bit turned on and biased on. So it's not quite class A because you're really only turning it on a teeny bit instead of halfway. But it's also not class B in that the transistor's not totally off. So that eliminates that crossover distortion. So basically as this one begins to change and this one begins to change the opposite direction they kind of have that little dead zone in the middle where they're both on for a second and they're both changing that voltage there till eventually this one that's turned on a little bit here will keep turning on more and more this one will keep turning off till it shuts fully off but by then this guy's already moving so you never have a point at which both transistors are shut off, even though you can swing that voltage the whole way relative to this center point. Now, there's a couple ways to do it. This is called quasi-complementary. Q-U-A-S-I complementary. The complementary means these two, these two nodes complement one another. They're equal and opposite. So this one's positive voltage, this one's the same amount negative voltage. That's the complementary part. 
quasi <laughs> means that's how the transistors are, are uh, configured. And we'll get into this here in a minute. So the problem that you run into is you now have two different transistors that have to turn on in two different methods. So you end up having problems with the, the phase of that signal, okay? So these, these circuits are, this is the, one of the earliest type of class AB because back in the day it was really hard to make two transistors of two different polarities that would match one another and, and kind of track with one another properly. So this is how they got around it. But there were some kind of negatives of how you had to have the driver circuit. Remember we talked about this one being a voltage amplifier to increase the amplitude of the signal and then your output to the speakers. Really, this doesn't have any gain. It just allows it to, to supply the high current that's needed by the, the low impedance or the 8 ohm or 4 ohm, whatever load. Well, in order for these guys to drive these guys properly, you have to do a couple of tricks to make sure that the phasing is doing this properly on each one of these because these are both the same polarity of transistor. Whereas when we go to our later ones, which this is what you're going to see the most of in a class AB amplifier, one side is NPN, the other side is PNP, and the main difference is this guy reacts to positive going voltage this guy reacts to negative going voltage. So really, you can directly connect this guy right here to here and everything's going to work good. Uh, the biasing and everything will be a lot easier. This is, this is a, just a better circuit all around. Although both can work very well if they're properly designed. But this is what you see today. And really that's class AB and class B. That's really what it is. You're splitting this signal up to where one half is, is handling the whole positive half cycle and the other half is handling the other negative half cycle and you can now get that full amount of voltage swing or very close to it I should say, you know, 70, 80 percent of it or more. Now, uh, what is zero switching amplifier? <laughs> Well, it's kind of a little gimmick if you ask me, although it works. Remember how we talked about if we're in class AB, there's that little center spot where both of these transistors are turned on and they're just kind of changing and then all of a sudden one of them will turn totally off but the other one's already conducting perfectly and moving. And then there's that crossover point where both transistors are handling the load and, we, and that eliminates that crossover distortion. Well, what a zero switching amplifier or a uh, new class A, I think they have all kind of marketing names for it. What they're doing is, even though this thing swings down below its bias point, there's another power supply that will hold that at that bias point, even, even when it's totally supposedly supposed to be shut off. So you don't ever have to go from a state of the transistor being totally switched off to it being switched on. The, in a regular class AB, the transistor will, will switch on while this thing is on its way to getting back to its center point. So in other words, they're still overlapping and you're never getting crossover distortion. But there's arguments that because the transistor briefly switches off and then switches back on in class AB that you could still have a tiny amount of distortion and by doing by leaving the transistor turned on all the time a little tiny bit while this the other side's doing its job with its half of the waveform when it goes back to cross through the the center point it does it does it uh, a little bit better and you get a lower distortion, okay? Now, again, a properly designed class AB, I don't know that you would hear much difference, but maybe you will, I don't know. I do know that the, the zero switching Pioneer amplifiers sound fantastic, but I don't know if it's because they're zero switching or if it's just because they're very well designed amplifiers with very good quality components in them. 
that's another debate for another video maybe. But anyway, that's class AB in general. I'm not going to get into great depth with it on this video because this is already a way too long video. But what I will do is the next project we're going to do, we'll get into a little more detail and we'll take some measurements and kind of look at this. So if you're still with me through this long and confusing video, <laughs> I thank you for your time and I uh, hope that this was a little bit helpful for some of you and I hope it didn't confuse you more but gave you a little better understanding of how these little circuits work. And uh, hopefully uh, as we go more and more into this, we learn more and more about it. And uh, really, I want this to inspire you guys to go out and do this for yourself. It's a great hobby. It's, uh, I really enjoy it. And I know a lot of you really want to get into this sort of thing and kind of don't know where to start or whatever, or maybe didn't have the opportunity to go to college or whatever. Um, or get some formal training on it. So hopefully this will help some of you out with that. Anyway, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. I thank you all for the donations and for the, all the well wishes and, and uh, good comments out there. And as always, I want you all to take care, and we'll be back soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.